All right, we're meeting with Bob Emser, and I've known Bob, I don't know, 15, 20 years maybe? Maybe not that long, but it feels like it sometimes. You know, I've watched his career, and, you know, he's really done a good job of, I think, growing beyond just making what I would consider gallery art and art for the homes to working on a lot of large-scale sculpture on a lot of different continents. And I want to speak to you tonight, Bob, in your capacity as a public sculptor and how you go about getting commissions and how you find out about them. Let's back up, though, first. How did you, I mean, am I, am I correct that initially you saw yourself as a sculptor making work that mostly was sold by galleries? Is that how you defined yourself earlier in your career? Oh, yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I went to school in the mid-70s, so, you know, that was the logical thing. You, I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't the information that there is now, so you just uh, thought you sat in your studio and uh, some wonderful gallerist out there sold your work for you and you just, you know, supplied them. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much how I started. And how did it change? Well, <clears throat> mostly changed for me. Uh, well, the big change was when I, I didn't make an income from uh, something other than the production of art. Uh, I taught for nearly 14 years. And when I got fed up with that, then I uh, went into developing an art center and um, did that for a while, uh, for about five years, which was great information for me to uh, be on the other end of the, um, uh, the other side of artists approaching me for shows and, and such. So um, you're in the Midwest, right? Yeah. Where do you live? I live in Eureka, which is about two and a half hours southwest of Chicago. And where was the art center? It was in Peoria, Illinois. How far is that from Eureka? Uh, Twenty minutes. It's uh, pretty much centrally located in Illinois. Well, we need to digress and talk about what's it like being a significant artist not in a significant city. How does that work? <laughs> well, you know, I think that that's why I stopped directing an art center is I realized one day that I was a really, really big fish in a very tiny pond. So uh, I realized I had to get in a bigger pond, which is when I moved my studio to Chicago. So you know, I'm fortunate in that I can I can leave leave here, be in Chicago, conduct business, and come back if I need to. Um, but I've got a small studio in Chicago and then a large studio uh, here in Eureka. Uh, mainly because it's, you know, small farming community and I've got a couple of acres and a great big building and all kinds of uh, suppliers that supply the agricultural industry as far as welders and metal fab shops and all that kind of thing. So it's a economical, uh, supplier-rich place to be. So you don't get a lot of people knocking on your door going, Bob, I need something 15 feet tall for downtown. No, you know, I, I've been thinking about building an airstrip out, out, you know, past the cornfields there so the Lear Jets could land, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but what I've been doing in the last, I mean, I've got a really nice studio down here, and I, uh, it's got enough space that I've probably got five or six large-scale pieces out on the grounds. Um, I've paid a lot of attention to how it's landscaped and kept up. Uh, so in the last three years I've been having studio visits. I throw a annual spring studio party and put out tents and I have some of the, there's a small college here in Eureka which is why I ended up here. Um, that's where I taught. Anyway, uh, you know, I get a little spring quartet playing in the corner and get some wine and some hors d'oeuvres going and, uh, you know, it becomes a big deal for people to come. So, uh, You're seeing these pictures from your site, right? Yep, I see them. Okay, okay good. Um, so how do you get work? I mean, what, what percentage of your – how do I want to do this? What percentage of pieces are, com are, you, are commissions? Almost all of them are commissions. Really? Even smaller scale things? 
even smaller scale things. But uh, I'm, I'm always doing small, small works because that's just, you know, that's where the ideas come from and because um, I'm getting to do what I want to do. And, there, you know, I sell a small percentage of those, but if, you know, I can't count on that to, to live. Um, so do you have gallery exhibits too or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, currently, I don't have any. Uh, I don't. I shouldn't say. I, I I have a couple of galleries that represent me, but uh, I don't have anybody in Chicago right now, which I did for the last I don't know probably seven years or so. Um, but they all t seem to be going out of business on me. Um. Are you? Where does your ego fall into making gallery work or commission work, or does it not? You know, how does your ego get? Is it taken care of, or you don't have much ego? How much stroking do you need, and how does sales take care of it? Your ego. Hmm, that's a good question. Well, I don't. I don't feel like I have to have an exhibit to feel like I'm. I don't feel need to be validated in that way. Um, I mean, it's always nice. I mean, I love I love acknowledgments, and I love you know when people come to openings and pat me on the back. But uh, for the most part, you know, the the acknowledgement comes from you know being able to do this full time. You know, people keep buying my work and commissioning me to do work. I think that's a probably enough. Um, How do these commissions happen? This is, you know, the, the salty good part. Uh, well, the the way that they've all, most of the beginning ones have all come from answering uh, RFQs, requests for qualifications, that and there's multiple, multiple places on the web that you can sign up and get on these list serves that will send you all of these listings. Why don't you name a few? Uh, one of them, well, the, the big one that everybody should know about is CAFE, which is a call for entries. CAFE is an acronym. Call for, I think it's call for entries. Um, yeah, there it is. Um, there's a listing in there, uh, and you can, I think you can even sort it by dates and all that kind of thing. Um, I have not had a lot of good luck getting commissions from the CAFE uh, website, however. Um, and I, I mean, I can go into that. I think it's, it, if it is, this is going to sound bad, but it levels the playing field too much. So for someone like myself that has a lot of experience and um, a good, strong portfolio, uh, I, I, I'm, that's ignored because somebody with lesser qualifications can appear to be the same. Um, so, see, there's a arts, uh, what's it called, uh, art deadline, I believe. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of them that you can just, I mean, if you just send them an email, uh, I believe, um, <laughs> woman out in uh, in at the Urban Art Institute, I think, in Massachusetts. Uh, she sends out a list uh, all the time. Um, uh, anyway, there. I mean, it's it's not hard. All you have to, you can just even put in request for qualifications, sculptors that, or artists or whatever your medium is, and stuff will pop up. So. Um, I know my my assistant has even actually found more of them than I even knew existed, just because she's, you know, a young Google expert. <laughs> so. But anyway, uh, I answer those requests. Uh, I I read them carefully and only submit to the ones that, when I'm reading it, it sounds like my work because you can drive yourself crazy. There are so many of them. And you, I, and I feel like I can only devote so much time in a week um, 
So I try to narrow it down that I only do maybe two a week, send out two proposals a week or two answer two requests a week. Um, because ultimately you only need one or two in a year and you've got a great year. Um, so two a week, that's a hundred of them. And that's enough for you to do to get enough work from them? Yeah, I mean, well, right now, right now it's good. Uh, about, if I was talking to you about 18 months ago, I would have told you how pathetic it was. Um, there was a point where I had sent out, uh, well, actually I was, was doing, had several commissions going, and so that's when I hired a studio manager to take over the duties of sending those out. And um, on the hundredth one, we decided to stop doing it for a while because we hadn't got, I was the finalist on one out of those hundred. Um, and so we took a, probably about a three month break and what I did, <laughs> we cooled a little bit and found a lot of success in um, doing studio visits, having um, people come and see my studio. Uh, and there were people that I didn't invite them with the intention that I was gonna sell them a sculpture, but with the intention that I knew that they knew somebody or they had control over creating something. And most of these were not commissions that they even knew that they needed. Um, and a couple of examples I'll give you is um, the first thing I did was I started with the undergrad school that I went to and called them up and I gave them I got this talk that I've been giving to uh, like I get invited routinely, you know, by rotaries and those kind of groups to, to talk. And I I changed that talk to something that I call sculptural economics, and it's basically uh, facts about how you know putting a sculpture in your community will make this community livelier and economically stronger. Um, so anyway, I gave them that little talk and usually it doesn't, you know, they're usually very bright people and they're like, wait, what about a, what about a sculpture on our campus or what about a sculpture in our town or um, what would it take and so forth. So this little town I live in, there's 6,000 people here and um, I invited my local alderman, which, you know, also is the, you know, the receptionist at the car dealership. And he, um, you know, he's like, hey, I, this, we need a piece of your sculpture on the town square. I'm like, that's a great idea, Zach. How do you think we could go about doing it? Well, you know, taxpayers wouldn't like that. And I'm like, well, I, maybe private money is the way to go. So anyway, long story short, it was they had a fundraiser at my studio this summer and they're about 25% uh, there. Um, so my guess is, and it'll take a while, you know, in nine, 10 months, they'll probably have enough money to commission me to build a piece for them. So, so I've been doing, I, I have probably right now about eight different projects at different levels are, and they're projects that I've completely invented myself. Uh, they're not, they're, they're places that people didn't even think they needed something, but I've just gone and suggested it and do it in the right way and, um, where are these places? Uh, the um, most of them are universities. The Bradley University, um, Valparaiso. Um, got one. Uh, there's a, a Harris Bank um, branch that uh, has a really ugly plaza out in front, and some of the area people around the bank said this is really ugly, and so um, got a proposal in front of. Harris Bank, um, they, they basically would donate it to this community group, so it'd be a tax deduction. Um, so let's see, um, like I said, the, my undergrad school, local town. Um, so let's see. You've been civically involved for a while. Has this come out of you being a civic good citizen or is this the other way around? Which happens, which serves which? Yeah, you know, that's, I don't know. It's a, I don't know that one was on purpose because of the question. Um, 
you know, I think I've always just I I I'm interested in in building a good community. And I you know, when I started teaching, I did all kinds of things to help, you know, gather artists together whether they are art visual artists or not, you know, starting things like coffee houses and that kind of thing and um and I think starting this art center it made me realize, you know, it's that, you know, it's, there's more to it than just a paycheck that you make, you make, you enrich a lot of people's lives. And from that, I've had the opportunity of working for not for profits and being on uh, boards of directors. And um, I'm not going to lie, all of those things generally, you meet people when you're on a board. The other people on the board are usually there because they're like-minded and most likely they uh, have money or the means or connections. So I have, uh, you know, I've, I've done well in doing private commissions because I've met people. Could you explain the difference of working on a piece, a small piece for your own interest in the studio that might end up in a gallery and working on a commission? The difference, uh, well, the first is, is much more enjoyable. Um, it's, I think a, a lot more creative, fun things can happen uh, when you're just working in that manner. Um, generally, when you're doing a commission, the, the committee or whoever is buying it wants to know exactly what they're getting. Uh, so a lot of decisions have already been made, and um, so when you get to actually building the work, there is sometimes there's not a lot of aha moments that happen. Um, there are in building the small maquette or doing the sketches uh, before you present it, but um, that was aha moments, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I heard it. I just want to make sure everybody got it, yeah, the, yeah. the technical yeah. phrase. <laughs> like, oh, I see how that works. Now, when you're doing the commissions, how, when are you getting paid? How's, how's this break down? They all vary slightly, but generally uh, at the signing of a contract, you'll get a percentage of it. Um, the commission I'm working on right now, I got um, – Let's see, it was 20% uh, down. After the piece is finished, I get 40%. Uh, and after it's installed, I get the final. That's not right. I'm sorry, 30% down, 40% on completion, and 30% after it's installed. Um, so that, that project will probably be most likely about a six-month project from uh, – my, I just literally probably two weeks ago got the contract signed. Is there a relationship between how much money you're spending on making the piece and the price of the piece? Yes. Um, with all of the the public um, RFQs, you know what the you you know they're they're saying how much money they have. And so you know what to present. Uh, you know, if they have um, they have fifty five thousand dollars, you know, you're not going to build something that's going to cost you fifty five thousand dollars to build. So I try to keep my uh, my actual costs, and what I mean by actual costs is not just the suppliers and the actual money that I see going out of my pocket, but also what uh, if I were renting my studio, what what rent should be? Um, there's, you know, using electricity, and you know, so I, so I know pretty much exactly how much. If I spend 30 days building a piece, I know how many, you know, what that's prorated down into as, as a cost. So I usually try to keep everything. Um, in a 25 to 30 percent of the total budget of the actual hard cost. So that doesn't include a salary for you or rent for the studio. Hard costs would be more like out of pocket. No, when I say hard costs, I mean rent for the studio as well. 
Okay. Uh, it, it would not include my salary, but it, right. but it does include my assistant salary. Right. Do you say, do you, are you more of a business person now than you were before you started doing commissions? Yeah. Uh, you know, I wasn't a business person at all when I was a teacher. Um, it's a pretty easy, it's a pretty easy gig when it gets down to it. Um, when I started the art center, uh, I remember going to my accountant <coughs> and basically kind of apologizing to her because I like, oh, I'm such a terrible businessman and I, you know, I don't know how this, and, and she just looked at me and she says, you don't have any idea how good of a businessman you are. Yep. And it was at that point, I'm like, oh, really? She's like, yeah, you're balancing your checkbook and you're paying all of your employees on time. I'm like, oh, okay. That separates you from a lot of people. That's great. So I think, you know, it's, I, I know so many artists that, uh, I mean, I have this, had this good friend whom uh, back when the state of Illinois was actually had money and they commissioned artists to do things, um, got this commission by, it was a community college mid-state and it was $50,000. And this is a Chicago-based sculptor and it was his first big commission. First thing he did is he went and bought a brand new truck. And I said, why did you do that? It's like you've been you've been making sculpture, you know, with an old truck for 10 years. Well, you know, I never had money like this before. Okay. So he presents this sculpture. Now, mind you, this campus is all one-story campus, and, you know, a new community college looking kind of thing. And he wanted to build a 43-foot sculpture for $50,000. All of us said, you know, that is, you can't do that. It's, you're, you're, it's, it's bad for the whole, you know, you're setting a bad precedence for other artists. Like, I'm making my mark. This is going to be my big ticket to the big world. So anyway, he built this thing. It was going to be out of, made out of concrete. He's going to need a 50-ton crane to lift this piece into place. Well, you can rent a 50-ton crane in Chicago for the day for $3,000. When you're down in, you know, nowhere land, the closest crane was Indiana. And it, they they quoted him a price. It was $35,000 for the day for this crane. And I, fortunately for him, when he presented this to the uh, committee, the president of the college saw it, and he, he just shook his head and said, this will not be the tallest thing on my campus. And he lost the condition completely. So, I mean, that's, a, that's probably a really extreme example of a really bad money manager, but it's a true story. So, um, you know, I, I'm a firm believer you shouldn't do a commission unless you can make some money at it. I've worked with a number of artists who have done commissions where they lost money, you know, and it, it, it doesn't feel right, you know. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, I mean, there's some situations where, you know, you, out of a ethical obligation, if the if the commission went sideways and, you know, the materials were faulty or you needed to go back and, you know, resurface the patina or whatever, some crazy thing that could have happened that, you know, maybe, you know, wasn't easily to foresee, you know, those things happen. Um, you know, I've had, I had a very small commission one time, and by small, I mean it was like $6,000. And um, part of this piece had copper in it. And the, my piece was I, I always seal the copper so that it stays a sh shiny copper color. And it was installed in this uh, um, in a commercial setting, and they called me back within six months and said it was rusting. And I'm like it has no iron in it; it can't rust. Well, I went and saw it. the The copper was horrible looking. I mean, it was not; it was just terrible. And so I said, well, "What's you know?" I started asking questions. Well, 
there's an irrigation system that sprinkled this sculpture every night. And I, and so they, you know, told me, oh, it's, you know, nothing's wrong with this, just pond water. So they had a retention pond that, you know, they kept. And so I called the supplier of the sealant up and I said, uh, you know, this is what's happening. What can thing? He says, so I have two questions. He says, is that pond near a farm or a golf course? And I said, well, yeah, there's, it's, you know, there's a cornfield next to it. And he says, it's, uh, it's a bunch of chemicals. He says, I hope nobody's drinking that water. And in fact, that's what it was. I had a, I paid to have a guy do a water sample of this pond and it had all kinds of unnameable chemicals in it. So I had to go in and I brought the sculpture back and I refinished it and this time I painted it with a epoxy paint that looks like copper and delivered it back to him. Now, you know, that the transportation and losing probably a week um, and having to have a supplier do the epoxy coating, you know, I probably <coughs> got another uh, $1,500 on it, which was not in the budget. So, you know, I, I probably lost money on that that one. And it was also long enough that I'd spent the money, so. You've done work out of the country too, right? Mm hmm Is that worth it? Uh, it's worth it because uh, it's uh, nice bragging rights. But the logistics ramp up a notch more difficult, right? Yeah, uh, there's uh, the, the well, first of all, it's you know it's a great way to see the world. I can't think of a better way to go to Italy than if you're accompanying your sculpture there. Um, so, uh, so that part, you know, becomes a possible uh, trip. Um, you always meet interesting people that way. Uh, it's, you know, you're in certain certain. Um, Areas you're revered, they find out you're an artist. Like uh, in Paris, they think you're pretty cool if you're from America and you're an artist. Um, I've done a show in Australia for, I did it four years uh, over probably a seven year period. And um, of those four years, two of the years they sold my work. So it, you know, it became a profitable thing. Um, and, you know, it's uh, 10 days in Sydney, not a bad thing to take. So. All right, all right, you guys, who's got questions for Bob? I don't see any hands yet. Somebody does. Go ahead, Michael. Michael, I'm letting you unmute yourself unless you want me to. I'm coming in. All right, oops, we both did it. I knew that was gonna happen. All right, you're unmuted, Michael, go ahead. Okay, um, hi, Bob. I recognize your work from the Elmhurst Art Museum. Oh. Uh, it looks really nice over there. Right. Um, just, uh, is there a possibility that you could send us those, those websites you mentioned? Cafe was one of them? Yeah, is sure. Something we could have reference to in a text form? Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I wasn't able to take notes at the time, so. Yeah, um, I, can, I can put a list together of, uh, you know, three If you want to send them to me, Bob, I'll forward it to everybody else. I'll absolutely do that. That would be great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as questions, um, I had one, and now I've forgotten it, so I'll come back. <laughs> All right, we'll get back to you, no problem. Who else had a question here? I don't think Lance has a question. Chris, do you have a question? Is my hand up? Yes, but I think that means you Sorry. don't. All right, take, I don't know how to tell you to take your hand down. Just do it. I Charles. Guess. There you go, but Chris, you got it. Charles, go ahead. Okay, I noticed uh, a slide uh, that flashed by very fast from your website with uh, Les Biederman building on it. We have a Les Biederman building here in Traverse City at the Northern Michigan College. Was that your work? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me how you got that job? 
Uh, that was a that was an RFQ that I answered. The the Denos Museum uh, put out a uh, a request for uh, artists, and that specific particular um, request wanted they wanted to acknowledge their volunteers. Um, if you're familiar with that school, which is uh, Northwestern Michigan College, Northwestern. <laughs> Do a uh, a large, um, which is where the Dennis Museum is there. They right. do a this big um, barbecue kind of thing, and they have all these volunteers that uh, you know are, are docents for the museum and uh, all kinds of things for the college. So once a year they do this big uh, uh, banquet for them outside, and uh, somebody had the idea that. It'd be great to have somehow that they commemorate these uh, these volunteers, and so the director of the Denos Museum, um, who's a pretty bright guy, a guy named Gene Gentleman, he thought, well, that's just another excuse for me to buy art. Yeah. So um, <laughs> that's what he, so they put it out, and you know they said that they wanted the work to uh, to celebrate volunteerism, um, but you, I mean, you can see by my work, it's like it's. I never do work that um, I change my my work to fit. If I think my work fits it, it's fine. And you know, they were basically wanting something that was you know not literal. They didn't want uh, you know some guy a statue of some guy standing on a stump or something. Right. Um, so uh, so anyway, it's. Uh, what one little trick that I learned from from that is they had a very low budget, and so when the director called me, <clears throat> he said um, that you know they had a very short list of people that they're interested in. I, so I asked him. I said, "Well, am I the first one you called?" And he said, "Yes." But well, that told me that I was his favorite. And um, so I said, "Well, if you don't have very much money, why don't you uh, why don't you bring me up?" I'll look at the campus, talk to the committee, and I said, if you absolutely hate me, send me home and then invite the next person. So um, I knew that you know I'm a likable guy. So once they <laughs> once I got there, they didn't invite anybody else. So I didn't have any competition. Yeah. Um, I later found out after it was all done that the director of all of the uh, um, of all of the submissions, he had already picked out that my work is the one he wanted. So he just needed the committee to go along with it. So I was really kind of playing into his hand really well. So yeah, I know Gene pretty well, and that is the way he works. Yes. Yeah. So it was Thank that you. was one of the uh, as one of a, one of my favorite um, commissions. It's like the best people ever to work with there. So Midwesterners. Yep. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Paul, you didn't fall asleep, did you? Oh, we can't hear yet. Still can't hear you, Paul. Hey, Paul. Well, I have a question wherever Paul is. Um, this is Gina. Gina, hold on. Uh, let me do this. Actually, this and the commissioner doesn't like it or wants to change something. Uh oh. I only heard half of that. Have you had bad experiences with your art where the person who was paying for the commission didn't like it, wanted their money back, um, et cetera? No. Have you, Gina? Yeah, I just missed all 
Yeah, Bob said he hasn't had that. You said you have. Um, we'll have to ask that question another time. You know, but some of the th say what? You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute you. Um, yeah. I just didn't it didn't work. Okay, now you're muted. Um, I think part of what Bob's saying here is, you know, and the same kind of thing I've been really reiterating to you guys all along is that you need to be creative in your career and not just creative with the next work of art that you're going to be working on. And you know, Josh, Josh had a question, but I want to get there um, in a moment. There was a commission that I worked on with Bob Stackhouse for the Indianapolis Art Center. And they called us up and they wanted a piece. And I, I would have to say, Bob, and I didn't think this out all that carefully. And we went there and we met with, um, I think her name's Carol Summers. And she described to us the piece that she wanted. And Bob and I both looked at each other and knew that what she was describing was essentially a $600,000, $700,000 piece, which we thought was pretty cool. And then I asked her how much her budget was, and she said $120,000. <laughs> So Bob was pretty upset and thought we were going to leave, you know. And all of a sudden, this idea flashed on my on me, and I said to Carol, "Isn't Indianapolis surrounded by quarries? And aren't there a lot of granite quarries here?" And she said, "Yeah, there certainly are." And I said, "Do you think you could get like 30 tons of quartz or uh, you know limestone donated to the uh, institution so that Bob can use it as raw material?" And she said, yeah. I said, you think you can get it transported here for free? And she said, yeah. And I said, you know, this is sort of like a school. Do you think you can get 30 people to help Stackhouse, you know, figure out how to make this thing? And she said, yes. And, you know, I turned to Bob. I said, for $125,000, would you make this piece? And she said, she, you know, and he, he said that he, he definitely would. So that piece happened because of that. You know, and... It's the same kind of thinking that Bob Emser is talking about is applying that kind of creativity and so on. I noticed that some people are talking about the echo. So, Bob, I muted you, and now I don't hear the echo, but I don't know if anybody else hears me or what. Um, Josh asked, and his microphone isn't working, so I want to read his question to you, which relates to what I just spoke about. He says to you, can you talk more about approaching institutions about commission work, like the banks, the schools, et cetera, you mentioned that some of these places were not looking to buy art when you encountered them. How did you get them from not looking to buying art to writing you a check? Let me un let me let me let me unmute you, and I'll, then I'll mute myself if there's any echo. Um, okay, Bob, you are unmuted. Well, the first thing I did is is um, found places that I had a, some kind of a connection to. So, you know, the easy thing is where you went to, for graduate school or where you went for your undergrad. And, you know, uh, like for the uh, uh, Bradley University where I got my graduate degree, I just invited the director of the art center over for uh, a studio visit and lunch. And, uh, you know, hoping out of the that experience that I would just maybe, you know, have a nice lunch. And lo and behold, he came up with this idea. He says, oh, wouldn't it be great to have one of your sculptures, you know, out in front of the art center? And I said, that sounds like a great idea. He says, but we don't have any money. And I said, well, you know, there's all kinds of ways to fund things. So um, anyway, from that, I went and uh, talked to the development officer, and she showed me around campus and told me how the chain of command worked. and um turns out they've got a um, um a, a campus beautification budget and so you know you can either put it in more flower beds or you could have a permanent sculpture so you know i just make arguments like that a little more eloquently than i just did but i'm giving you the really quick abbreviated version um the other thing is you can't plan on this happening you know having them visit uh, on Wednesday, and they're going to write you a check, you know, in two weeks. Um, the first visit I had with that guy has probably been um, probably 16 months ago, and the the project is still it's still evolving. Um, I know that you know they're they're committed, but they haven't you know it hasn't been 
fully funded yet, and you know, they haven't written me a check, but they're going to, just because I know they will, because I won't let them not. Does that help? Paul, you're muted. Can't hear you. You're still muted. Thanks, people. <laughs> How many how many of these commissions come out of um, your individual efforts, Bob? You said you've got eight or so that are I've got sort eight, of eight, eight in different in different stages of uh, you know negotiation. Put it that way. Um, I don't expect all eight of, of them to actually become a commission, but um, you know, if two do, that'd be great. Um, of those eight, how many of them, you know, came about as as your initiative beyond well, filling out a form? All eight of them are because of my initiative. But not I mean, from CAFE or an RFP. No, I mean of of the of the things that I've actually answered, I'm uh, I have one commission right now that I've like I had mentioned earlier that I just signed the contract on, and um, I'm a finalist on two more. Um, so. Um, you know, so th those will happen before the others. Uh, there is a, this is a, another, I'll give you another example of one of them that I can Excuse me. Uh, I had, uh, had had from the art center, I had known some, some people at the, at the civic center in Peoria. And I basically was just calling, uh, the director up just to kind of reconnect with her. Uh, so I sent her an email and saying, you know, I'd love to stop by and just, you know, take you for a cup of coffee. And um, she emailed me back like within minutes saying, um, wow, what good timing you have. Uh, I'm forwarding this on to another woman who's in charge of the art purchase committee. And could you meet us, uh, you know, a week from Tuesday? And I went, and they basically they had uh, twenty thousand dollars waiting for an artist to do a commission, and they just couldn't figure out who. And so um, the trick was was figuring out how I could do something for twenty thousand dollars and make some money. So uh, it took me a little while to come up with what that plan is, and um, I'm going to do that because it they had this wall that was huge. It's like it's like 60 feet long and 32 feet tall, and they wanted something on that wall. I'm like, you're kidding me. It's kind of like, you know, Paul's comment about this little bit of money that that they had for this back house. So I do a, a series of gallery work that I call shadow drawings, where the shadow is as important a part of the sculpture as the sculpture itself. So I came up with this idea of building this fairly small wireframed sculpture that I then uplit with shadows that created basically bathed the whole wall with art. Um, so they're totally in love with it and uh, can't wait. So um, so that's basically all it needs to do is just I need to present it to the Civic Center Commission, which will essentially just rubber stamp the idea, and uh, I'll probably get started on that uh, first of the year. How much of your success is based on the quality of your art, and how much of it's based on the quality of your personality? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, they kind of go hand in hand, I think. Probably, if you find art that doesn't isn't very good, you probably don't meet a person that's very interesting either. Um, you know, I'm, I, if my father was an engineer, so I, I can't help but make things fit and work good. Um, and uh, believe it or not, I, I was an extremely shy, introverted kid. And um, 
being realizing that the only way that I was really going to make a living as being an artist was stepping outside of that and talking to people and not being afraid to say, I'm an artist, and um, but I'm asking me questions. And, um, That's and some I, important I information. I, uh, <clears throat> this has been some time ago. Um, well, I, I'm going to say this, this is important, and all of you already know this because you're subscribed to Paul's class here. But uh, probably about, I'd say about 14 years ago, I hired a, uh, a career coach uh, that was, was not necessarily a career coach for an artist. So she got me to a certain point in basically really taking myself seriously. And over that period of time, I've not always had a coach, but I probably hired maybe four different coaches. Um, I'm working with somebody right now uh, that's more specifically just uh, fine art. But it makes a big difference uh, to have an advocate asking you hard questions and, you know, why are you doing that? Why aren't you doing that? You know, how do you feel about that? Um, how do you think you could do it better? What are your ideas? And it's, uh, it's, it's an important part of my process to have that. So, um, so at any rate, um, one of my coaches one time, uh, had asked me, like, where, you know, to basically, uh, do like a visual, uh, imagery of seeing myself where I wanted to be. And one of the, she said, you know, come up with the scenario. And I said, well, I'm, I'm giving a lecture, uh, at a major university on how to be a successful artist. And so she said, so write the lecture. I said, but I don't know how. She says, yes, you do. And so it took me probably about two weeks, but I wrote that lecture and I've never delivered it, but it, uh, it it made me know I really made myself a roadmap of what all I had to do is follow what I wrote. And it, and nobody had to tell me how to do it. I figured it out on my own. And I, and I think that's the important thing that we all know. You know, we're artists. We figure stuff out. And you know how to do – wherever you want to go, you know how to get there. And it might have to be pulled out of you in some way, but – Whatever way you can figure that out, you know, write about it, uh, make art about it, hire a coach, take a webinar. So. You're getting people who are submitting compliments to me about how good you are. <laughs> well, pass them on. No. I let my ego stroke. <laughs> Gina, I'm going to be meeting Gina and letting Gina ask the questions. Okay. Gina, you are unmuted. I don't think so. I think okay. you are. <laughs> so how did you get your over oh, all right? How did you get your overseas commission? Uh say I there I there's a there's some uh international websites that you can subscribe to. Uh, so those weren't just personal contacts or anything. Well, I'll give you the example of the the uh, the one in Australia. Um, actually, where, where Paul and I met is I was directing a show in Chicago called Pier Walk, and um, I did that for about two years. And what basically happened was it got kind of taken over by bankers and stockbrokers. And so what it was really an important show for Chicago sculptors and we were all sitting around, you know, at a bar one time crying in our beer, literally. And um so I went home and I'm bought and one of the taglines that we said for Pier Walk was it was the world's largest outdoor sculpture exhibit. And so I put that in Google. I put those words and well Pier Walk didn't pop up a show in Australia called Sculpture by the Sea popped up. And I'm like, what is this? I investigated it. I put together a packet of five 
Chicago artist because I thought, well, you know, shipping has got to be horrendous to maybe if we share it all. And um, three of the five got in the show. I was one of them. The other two crapped out because they just didn't they just didn't follow through. And uh, I was determined that I was going to go. So I figured out how to build my sculpture and, and make it collapse into a suitcase. So I got a round trip ticket, put it on my visa card, and, and I went, took my luggage. And I put the piece up on the beach and had a wonderful 14 days in Sydney. And they uh, they said, no, you can't take it back. You know, everybody likes it so much. And I'm like, well, you know, I this is how I, I don't have funding to send it back. And they said, don't worry about it. We'll send it back to you. And if, if it doesn't sell in a year, we'll sell it, send it back. Well, they ended up selling it then. So, so that's the example. It just, you know, you know, whatever, think up a phrase of, you know, whatever deals with your art, put it in there and see if something pops up. Um, so. And I think Bob's been a little bit lucky, but mostly he's worked really hard and really efficiently and is rather creative not only in making his work of, works of art, but in his career. I mean, you know, I think it's the same kind of thing we're telling everybody here. You should, if you think of your your career like a piece of artwork, you know, it's a process, you know, because, you know, none of us are really interested in, uh, I mean, it's like Paul's earlier question about working on gallery pieces. Well, you know, I'm always got one going because finishing it isn't really necessary the goal as much as the working on it. And your career is the same thing. It's like, you know, you work on it. Um, I remember early on, I had a, had a friend that was a uh, museum director and gave me the, I've got it somewhere here. Anyway, he gave me the, the uh, AMA's uh, index, every museum in the United States listed in this thing. And things like, you know, two inches thick. And I would sit, you know, television on and with my computer and on my lap, and I <coughs> went every page. And of course, I skipped the, you know, nature museums and the science museums, and it said an art museum. I entered all the information into my database. So then when I was later, years later, when I had information to send out, I had this big database that, uh, so, in the, the thing that was probably more important, you know, I could have gone and bought the same thing, it'd been more efficient, but the fact is that every minute I felt like I was doing something. Even if all I was doing is entering, you know, who the curator is at XYZ Museum. So it's um, little tasks like that that I just would do just because then, um, you know, I, I felt like I was working working on it. Mm -hmm. Those are already good ideas. David, did you have a question? I just had a kind of a tacky question. I was curious what your overhead on two acres in Illinois is. And, uh, <laughs> well, I, I'll give you, first of all, I own it free and clear. So, um, that part, it, it, so these numbers are, are going to be a little more uh, um, as, as if there was a loan, okay? That for, to maintain that studio and the studio in Chicago, I travel back and forth, which is pretty much every week. My studio assistant's uh, salary, my, all of my insurance costs, all of my um, uh, real estate taxes, um, utilities. I know that I need to bring in about five thousand a month just to cover that. Does that answer your question? Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Do, do, you, do you have to carry liability for the public sculptures after they're done? I carry liability insurance. Nobody's puts a gun to my head, except, you know, common sense. I'm probably the last one, though, you know, if something happened, I'd probably be the last one they'd go after. Because, you know, when uh, 
if somebody were injured by a sculpture, they, you know, it's, they, they, they just sue, sue the city first. Yeah, they sue yeah. the city, they sue, you know, they go for the deep pockets. To whoever. So, you know, but I, I carry a, I carry a million dollar umbrella policy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's really not that much money, to be honest with you. So, for the peace of mind. Yeah, it's worth it. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah, I, I remembered my question. Okay, Michael. Um, regarding uh, going after a commission, if you've been asked to do a commission from an individual, this is a hypothetical situation, uh, and then they're kind of putting you off after that, do you, do you pursue them or do you kind of leave them alone? Um, I, I pursue them until they say get lost. <laughs> okay. Um, I asked, I asked a, um, a consultant one, well, the consultant I'm working with right now, I asked him, I, I said, uh, when do you know that no is the answer? And his answer to me was, in 1971, the city of New York told Christo, no, you cannot put your gates in Central Park. But we all know in 2005, Christo had his gates in Central Park. So, right. I so, saw that. <laughs> so no is never no. You might have to you might have to wait for uh, a new president or a new mayor or the world to you know tip five degrees on its axis or something. But I, I there's actually uh, you know there's a collector right now that uh, I met at Art Chicago this year and said to me, I've been look at, watching your work for, for a long time and I, I would like you to come out and see my house and I'd like to commission you to do, to do a piece. So that was in May. It took until July after repeated phone calling and emailing and finally he's like, okay, yeah, come on out. I went out, I saw it and my question to him is, was, what's your budget? And he didn't know. And I said, well, as soon as you figure that out, let me know, and then I'll build you a piece to fit your budget. And so he has not said no to me, but he hasn't. He, he answers, he's answers my phone messages and emails sporadically. So, but I've got a list of a whole bunch of, not a whole bunch, but a number of people like that. And about every two weeks, I send an email or put a voicemail out and um, just, I just don't give up. Um, because one of the things that I, I don't assume is that they're, if they're not answering me, I don't assume that that means no. Okay. I just assume they're really busy. I like what you said about um, asking them what their budget is. I, I, I guess I hadn't thought of that before. I usually uh, have given a price mm -hmm. and then <laughs> don't hear from them. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's two. I mean, that's one way to do it. Okay. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Thank this, you. This situation re was, is a situation where it could have been you know, it could have been a six foot tall piece or it could have been a 12 foot tall piece, given, you know, which which of the three places that he showed me in their yard that it would go. So it's sort of like, well, you know, you can let me know, you know, what would you want to put, where do you, you know, so. All right, thank you so much. You're welcome, Michael. Thank you both, anybody else? I have a question. Take it away. Um, yeah, since you, it sounds like you, the majority of your work is commissioned. I'm just wondering, is this out of necessity or is it a preferred way of working now that you're, it's something you're comfortable working this way? Um, well, it's, it's a little easier to plan. Um, 
yeah, I, it's you know, it's just it's how it's how it's all panned out for me. Uh, certainly, if if I had had the right gallerist, and I may still be doing just gallery work, if that's how it worked out, you know. But um, it's a lot easier to build two large pieces than to build you know 20 small ones. You have yeah, to have yeah. 20 buyers, or you only have to have three. So. I know a lot of artists who have a nice balance between the gallery work and the commissions they do. And sometimes they'll not do any of one for a year and while they focus on the other, and sometimes they do both. I think it's important to know that this kind of opportunity that Bob is speaking about is available. It doesn't mean that you need to go that route, and, but it is probably something you ought to give some thought to. It, you know, it, it's it's pretty reliable source of ongoing income. Well, we've gone just past the hour, Mark. Anybody else want to say something, or should we wrap it up? I'm ready to go. I just have a quick question. Sure, please ask. How do you find these career coaches? Um, ask me. I'll tell you who they are. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Paul knows. There are about three or four people that are doing things comparable to what I'm doing, and they're all a little bit. We're all a little bit different. <laughs> Excuse me, I didn't know about them until I got started. Some people have been doing this a lot longer. I'll share that information later on. And or if you send me an email, I'll, I'll put it in an email for you. Yeah. And there are there are career coaches that don't specialize in, in working with artists. They'll just work with, you know, um, you know, some of the coaches I've had were just uh, simply business coaches. So, uh, and you can, uh, I mean, you can Google that. Life coaches is another word that it's used, and it's more than a life coach, but business coach. And look up art mentor too, or business mentor. But you know, start throwing those terms around. You find many. Make sure you okay. Okay. Make I'm sure sorry. What about? I said make sure you see a picture of them first, because sometimes when you see a picture, you're like, no, that person ain't gonna help me. Yeah, but some of these people are coaching people who do duck painting and things or duck stamps. But they have but the information's really solid too. You just have to swap out commission for duck stamp. <laughs> All right, everybody. Um I'm gonna stop this recording and then I have a couple more things to say. Bob, thank you so much for being with us. I think you've given people, you know, tangible, useful, reliable information. I appreciate it. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye, everybody. Goodbye, Bye. Bob. Thank you.